Welcome to another episode of Code for Thought. Welcome to the Windy City, the city of jazz, and the place for the first ever conference for research software engineering in the US, the one and only Chicago. And the event took place between the 16th and the 18th of October 2023 at the University of Illinois in Chicago. The house was sold out in advance and there were very few last-minute cancellations that the organizing team luckily were able to fill quickly. Over three days we had a pretty full program with a nice mix of technical and community-oriented presentations, keynotes, birds of feather sessions, poster sessions and social events. This being the first face-to-face -face event for the RSE Association in the US ever, there was, understandably, a lot of excitement and buzz in the air. And over the course of this episode, you'll hear from a number of participants, presenters, association board members and organisers. Attendees came from all over the US and some, like myself, from other countries. There were sponsors from national labs and other organisations present, and a fantastic organising team and volunteers that kept all the plates spinning. After Sandra Giesing, the chair of the organising committee and now the executive director, kicked off the event on Monday morning, we had our first keynote speaker, Marianne Lang. Marianne leads the Sustainable Horizons Institute in the US, and she gave a very impassioned talk about the work the Institute and she do in terms of diversity in the workplace. I found the journey that got her to leading this effort inspiring. It's been a varied and colourful career, and this should strike home with many research software engineers, because after all, our career paths rarely follow a straight line. But it's also important that we open up the workplace to people from all backgrounds and give them an opportunity to join our community. This is not an easy thing to do because, as Marianne says, you can't expect things to change unless you're prepared to change yourself. I had the pleasure of talking to Marianne briefly after her keynote. I'm Marianne Leung. I am the founder and president of Sustainable Horizons Institute, a computational chemist by training. And you gave a keynote here today about some very interesting stuff about diversity, inclusion and uh, equality. How we get there because the workforce at the moment isn't particularly diverse, is it? That's very true. It's not, it, not in, this, in, in these fields. It's not very diverse mm. at all. So I took a few numbers down because you did this online survey. So we had 20% roughly who were women, identified as women, 72% uh -huh. men and 8% non-binary. And I think it was 74% white. Yes. Were you surprised by these numbers? Yes and no. I think these numbers are um, consistent with what is um, around in the field. I was really expecting that because the US RSC has done a lot already to promote diversity, that maybe we'd see something different here. Let's talk about the institute that you're heading. So what is it and what is it trying to do? <laughs> That's a great question. So the Institute is dedicated towards building the scientific workforce through the lens of diversity, equity, inclusion. And what does that mean? That means what we're trying to um, help people who aren't already there, what I call the unusual suspects, get there. And <laughs> <laughs> the unusual suspects. Unusual like suspects. <laughs> and in addition to that, we're trying to help, or kind of more importantly, we're trying to help the organizations, whether it be a national lab or an academic institution or a professional society, help them learn how to create more inclusive cultures so that it's easy for people to come so they don't feel like they're that canary in the coal mine wondering whether they can survive because they're the only one who looks like them or identifies like they do. Are there any concrete steps that you saw being rolled out that actually work in terms of creating a more diverse workforce? Yes. So luckily through our work over the years, I feel like, like I say, we're going to work on a study to provide more hard evidence. But anecdotally, we see people. So a lot of the people that we've supported uh, through our programs have gone into the workforce. They're from underrepresented groups and they're now working in these very homogeneous 
places and by the work that we do to try to help, like I say, catalyze this creation of inclusive environments. That work is hard and slow, but we feel like we do see evidence of that. We did do a study uh, quite a few years back and we mm. got some data back from the scientists that we work with that in- helped to indicate this was true. Like I say, essentially the quote was, I had no idea that there were people that were really great that I want to collaborate with from an institution I never heard of. To me, that's like one of the biggest successes because someone figured out that they have to change the way they're thinking. There's a lot of institutional bias. People think if you didn't come from Harvard or Yale, you know, you, you're not going to be good enough. You're not going to be good enough mm-hmm. to work here. But there's lots of really fabulous, bright, motivated people who come from other places. Indeed, and that leads me to the quote that I really like, which is, if you want diversity, you really have to do things differently, isn't it? That was the big call to arms to yeah. for you, yes. so you can't just sit on your laurels. And that's the hardest thing for everyone because, you know, mm. people who are in leadership positions, they're there because they've been successful yeah. and they they have patterns of their success. And so it's ingrained in them that they have to do it the same way. But you can't. You can't just continue to do things the same way if you want to have a different outcome. If people want to join you or people want to hear from you, how do, you, how do they get in touch with you? Oh, well, they can just, you know, reach out to us. We're on social media. We have email. We have all of the different... We, have, we even have phone numbers. <laughs> so <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> we're always open to hear from people. As Marianne says, if you're interested in the work or want to contribute in any way, get in touch. The other keynote of the conference was delivered by none other than Neil Chu Hong, the director of the Software Sustainability Institute in the UK, who travelled to Chicago to talk about his vision for the next 10 years of research software engineering. Since the term was coined in 2012, just over 10 years ago, a lot has been achieved in the UK, in the US and in other countries. Research software engineering is a profession that is beginning to be recognised, and so Neil laid out his ideas how we RSEs can use the next 10 years to help address the many challenges we face today. Following the keynotes, we had a range of presentations and workshops, some parallel sessions, and a number of them focused on technical questions and solutions. And so in the next section, I'll be talking about some of them. All presentations and papers, including the technical ones of course, were nicely grouped together into central themes, one of which focused on developer operations or DevOps and cyber infrastructure. This should come as no surprise of course, as infrastructure and DevOps is essential to run research applications and a number of RSEs work exactly in that space. As in other areas of research software engineering, the kind of work we do there covers a wide range And that's true for infrastructure and DevOps as well. And so amongst talks on cloud infrastructure for research apps and interconnected science workflows, we heard a presentation on population modeling as well. Its presenter was Joseph Tukilo from Oak Ridge Labs. I caught up with Joseph afterwards to talk a little bit about his paper and the work he and his team does at Oak Ridge. Hi Joseph. Hi. Uh, You gave a presentation yesterday about, and I'm reading this out, a reproducible method for downscaling synthetic populations to realistic residential locations. That's quite a long title, so, but I got intrigued by that. And could you perhaps explain a little bit about what that was Um, all about? Yeah, so for a variety of um, different human security challenges, whether it's epidemiology or responding to natural hazards or better understanding how people access essential services like food and healthcare, we need to have a better sense of how people travel about kind of real world transportation networks. So a a key ingredient in that is to model a virtual representation of what a neighborhood's population is like. We can never really get, for logistical challenges and, and issues of privacy, we can never get a a complete head count of what a a neighborhood's population looks like in multiple dimensions. But we can kind of make an approximation of it using what's called uh, census microdata. The census puts out a a survey every year called the American Community Survey. 
And as part of that, they uh, publish an anonymized sample of responses that, that can be then used to generate kind of this virtual representation of neighborhoods' populations. Mm -hmm. That's the Urban Pop project that Oak Ridge National Lab produces. And that was my next question. You are actually at Oak Ridge National Labor Laboratory. Yep. And what's your role there? I'm a research scientist. I've been there about three years now. So when I came into the lab, I took the lead on this Urban Pop project, which has been in place for about seven or eight years. I think it started in 2015 or 2016. And the focus has always been on human dynamics modeling. So, you know, taking yeah. neighborhood populations and trying to allocate them to likely daytime activities. And so in the past, this was kind of modeled at sort of a neighborhood to neighborhood scale. So, you know, you kind of know the flows among areas in a city that people were traveling for school or work, but not necessarily the kinds of routes that people would take and the cost of traveling, which are important things when we're interested in modeling access to critical infrastructure and services. When I took the lead on the project, um, we began to create a new toolkit to support it called Likeness, which is a, a set of Python tools that allow us right. to generate these virtual or synthetic populations and then model plausible activities that they might take. Kind of a missing piece of the puzzle that I've been working to fill in over the past year is what I discussed in the talk yesterday, which is trying to model plausible residential locations for as starting ending points of the trips. So how um, big is your team? My immediate team is pretty small, um, <laughs> but it's, <you>. it's, it's <laughs> me, it's, it's myself and another collaborator, James Gabbawardi. Yeah, we have a four or five Python packages in this toolkit that we're kind of actively juggling maintenance duties on, but you know, we're hoping to expand that soon. Another large block of technical talks was dedicated to tooling and research and development scheduled for the second day of the conference. Which brings me to Jeffrey Lentner, who gave a talk on monorepos for research software projects. Coincidentally, a poster on the same subject was presented in the poster session on the first day of the conference. The poster presented by Ludovico Bianchi, Daniel Gunter and Keith Betty drew everyone's attention and rightly won a prize. What's also intriguing about this is how this conference brought different groups together who work on similar problems. And in the following brief chat I had with Jeffrey after his talk, he explains how he was surprised to find someone else was working on it as well. Hi, awesome. Jeffrey. Hi. So you're from Purdue University. Yeah, just down the road. Uh, it's only about two hours down Interstate 65, West Lafayette, Indiana. We're the big engineering school in the Midwest. Uh, home Ignorant. of the astronauts. That's um, our claim to fame. You did give a great talk about monorepos. Yeah. Describe to me and to the listeners what the problem space is that we're dealing with here. Essentially, when you're working on a large scientific software project, something full stack or, or similar that's got a lot of pieces and it's got a lot of moving parts, eventually you'll run into this situation where you know, all of the dependencies that get brought in when you try to sort of build mm. and deploy this thing, if it's like this massive single installable unit, the moment you try to do something that you feel is like just a smaller piece, everything has to come along for the ride. And so the main thrust of the talk was just the notion that eventually, if your project lives long enough, you'll have a mind to break that up into little sub packages yeah. so that you can deploy them separately. But that brings a bunch of challenges with it. If you've had a project that's all been under one roof as like a single deployable package, and you break it up into 12, and you have those in separate repos following the same structures that you would for you know any smaller project, you run into these problems where are they all in sync with each other? Invariably, you'll have one component that is somewhat coupled to another one. So in my case, there's a, like a REST API that's part of the project. And I wanted to make it easier for the end users who are not software engineers, yeah. but are technical. Like the astronomers these days are very technical people. They've always been, but you know they're not gonna run curl, right? <laughs> um, and so I, I, you know, I've dream. got this you know modern token-based authentication system for the REST API, and there's some moving pieces there. And so most projects these days, if they're nice to their users, mm. are going to offer some kind of client package. You know, you just pip install thing dash client. But the issue was this project that I was working on has a lot of data science components, right? It's a big yeah. pipeline that runs on the HPC infrastructure. 
And so I have everything you can imagine, like TensorFlow and all its friends installed. And so my, you know, the Anaconda environment it's is a like a long dependency it, list. Then. It's like a five gigabyte virtual environment. And if you just yeah. wanted to have a thin client, why in the world would you want to abuse your users and making them install <laughs> that thing? And so you wanted to separate it out. And so the idea of a mono repo was just that a lot of the problems that you run into, you could solve by still having them in the separate packages, but just bringing them back under one roof mm. together in a single version control repository. But you have to do it differently than when you started, because it sounds a bit like full circle. You start with a yeah. mono repo, you split it well, all up, you bring it back together again. Yeah, yeah. So the word mono shows up twice there. So I started out yeah. with something I would call a monolith in the sense that it was one Python package. There was only one thing that you were pip installing. It did kind of come full circle. So it was in a single repository, but the sort of evolution here is that at first glance, your next step, if you separate them into independent packages, typically you would put a package in its own repo. There's plenty of opinion, but there's not a lot of reasoned thought out there that I could find about what kind of structures you could have inside of the repository. There's only the one, like, what an open source scientific Python package looks like on GitHub. There's sort of a canonical layout to that, right? And so that's where you would gravitate towards having a separate repo but uh, for each one. But bringing them all under one roof, what does that look like? How do you organize them? And how do they interact with each other inside of that one space? A lot of that was missing, and I'm just feeling around in the dark and sharing what I found. But you're not the only one, because there was this great poster about state core. Yeah, I originally courses. wasn't sure if this was even a topic that people would be interested in. You know, I thought maybe it was just me, and it was obvious, and like this mm. was a, like a non-thing, and it was just my inexperience yeah. talking. But at this conference, we had a group from, and I can't remember the lad's name that was uh, sharing the poster at the poster reception last night. I think all three of them on the, on the poster are from Berkeley National Labs. Like, it's actually awesome that somebody else is dealing with the same issue and thought, well, mm. nobody's talking about this. Maybe we should put something out there and talk about it. Of course, there were other blocks of technical sessions as well that covered areas such as software engineering practices and machine learning. High-performance computing was well represented in all of these sessions. And HPC may be a, shall we say, more traditional playground for research software engineers. But as you will hear from Ian Costin a little bit later, software permeates all areas of research, and it was good to see engineers from other fields at the conference as well. But before we go into that, I want to briefly touch on the Birds of Feather sessions in the following section. <laughs> And we had a range of Birds of a Feather sessions to meet and talk informally about different areas of interest. I'd like to highlight two of them in particular. The first was on the subject of notebooks as a possible future for scientific publications. The idea isn't exactly new, but in the session on the last conference day, a number of presenters showcased how this can pan out in future. One of them, Brian Zadora, was from the American Geophysical Union, AGU, and an initiative they founded called Notebook Now. Listeners of this podcast may remember my report on the Jupiter Conference in Paris from May this year. At the time, Notebook Now, an attempt to use notebooks as a scientific publishing vehicle, featured big in the conference, with tools like, for instance, MIST. Exciting as it all sounds, though, it is not without difficulties. As the program organizers of USRSE, including Dan Katz and Nicole Brewer, mentioned in the session, because people could and did submit notebooks as papers and presentations for this conference. One question, for instance, is around reviewing notebooks. To guarantee impartiality, papers are usually anonymized. But it's not practical to anonymize notebooks, particularly when they are submitted from GitHub accounts or similar. And then some of the notebooks may contain computationally intensive work, and how would you be able to ensure a smooth operation when it's published? Who will pay for it? And who will do the maintenance? Questions that will no doubt occupy the minds of researchers and engineers in days to come. But the hope is that notebooks will revolutionize scientific publishing the way that HTML and XML did with news reporting and prints 20 years ago. Python libraries and how to navigate and assess them for research was the subject of another Birds of a Feather session run by Leah Wasser. 
That Python is a popular programming language for scientists is, to put it mildly, an understatement. But as Leia points out, the space, with its gazillion different packages, including open source packages, is sometimes difficult to navigate, particularly for beginners. Leia created PyOpenSci to help with providing peer reviews for packages, and we had a very good and interesting discussion about community building and how PyOpenSci works with other initiatives, such as JAWS. And here are a few words from Leia, who I met afterwards. I am the executive director and founder of PyOpenSci, and PyOpenSci is a diverse community that's supporting the Python open tools that are driving open science. And the motivation, um, we have three programs. We have peer review. We provide community resources that are kind of a support and training element and um, mentorship and learning resources. The motivation for PyOpenSci and what we're trying to accomplish is really to support maintainers in building and creating Python packages. We promote their work that's so critical to scientists. And we do this through peer review and partnerships. We have two other things that we're trying to accomplish with PyOpenSci. We want to make the packaging ecosystem easier to navigate mm -hmm. for people that are building these tools and maintaining these tools. And we do that through developing learning resources. And then finally, we're trying to diversify the ecosystem to get more people involved from different backgrounds, different gender identities. And we do that through mentorship and training. It's quite a lot going on. When did it all start? So I founded PyOpenSci in 2018 and then we began our formal peer review process in 2019. In the past year we've been funded by the Sloan Foundation so mm -hmm. I'm very grateful to now be able to work on this full-time. When we talk about peer reviews we're talking about peer reviews of Python packages aren't we? It's not like the peer review of papers it's peer review of software isn't it? Yeah it's peer review of software so we're reviewing the tools that people are creating that research software engineers mm -hmm. and scientists scientists are creating to process data, the tools that scientists need that are trying to create open reproducible workflows to actually build those workflows. And them being open source is very important because that allows anyone, because they're free, they're permissively licensed, so that anyone can actually use them. What was your motivation to actually get started in 2018? So my motivation is that I've seen the challenges in open source from both sides. Mm. I've seen the challenges from the side of a maintainer and someone that's contributing to open source. And then I've also seen the challenges from the side of a student or someone that's newer, a graduate student that is learning these tools, that is learning data science and trying to navigate the ecosystem. As a maintainer and contributor, what's really challenging in the academic environment is that that work on open source is not valued in the same way as traditional academic research, even though the open source tools are what's driving the research. Those are the tools that people are using to process the data that's creating that research outcome. And then from a student perspective or someone newer to the ecosystem, because Python specifically is such a diverse landscape, it can be really tricky to get started. It can be tricky to find the right tools to use because there are so many options. Mm. And so we're trying to target both sides of those, those pain points associated with the open source ecosystem through PyOpenSci. And then finally, as a female in this space, I've just experienced the walking into a room and feeling maybe different from the rest of the room. And so those are all the pieces that kind of feed into PyOpenSci's mission. There was also quite a bit of discussion about PyOpenSci and its relation to others, like for instance, JAWS. Yeah. Maybe you can comment on that briefly. Yeah, absolutely. That's a question that we often get, the difference between PyOpenSci and JAWS. And they're really complementary efforts. But it's important to recognize that JAWS is really about filling that gap in publication of software. Whereas PyOpenSci, we value that. That is critical. And that's why we have a partnership with JAWS, where you can be reviewed by us 
and they JOS accepts our review and then we'll publish your package if it's in scope. But we also care about what happens after that publication. Right. We want to make sure that tools are maintained over time, that they're usable, and so we want scientists to be able to trust tools within our ecosystem are things that are being actively maintained that they can use. And so that's one of the core differences and also the scope of JOS is more narrow because of they have very specific criteria around what is scholarly research in the form of software, whereas we are open to supporting and reviewing any tool that would be used by scientists for open science workflows. Finally, my last question is, what's next? What are your plans? I love that question. Um, we're so grateful to be funded by Sloan Foundation. Mm. They've opened so many doors for us and for the open science community. And what's next is we have a community manager that is starting in a few weeks, actually, okay. in November. And through that, we'll be able to do even more community outreach and engagement, spread the word, and also start to develop out our learning resources. So I've been talking about those a lot, and there's drafts underway, but having another person to actually work on those resources, which I know the community needs, will be a really big step for us over mm -hmm. the next year. And I'll be looking forward to hear more about Pi OpenSci and what Leia and her team are up to. Okay, well, that's already a lot to take in, but we're not done just yet, because there's also the more community-oriented aspect of the conference that I haven't covered yet, but which I will in the following section. Communities can't run on autopilot, and even more so for communities that are relatively young, such as research software engineering. And so we had a block of presentations and workshops on the subject at the conference. The USRZ community itself has grown quite well since its beginning, and now stands at roughly 2,000 association members, and hopefully growing. One of the founding members and board member is Dan Katz, and in one of the sessions on culture and community, he gave a talk on experiences in how RSE community identity leads to improved research software practices. Dan and I touch on that briefly in our following chat, including his work on JOS, the Journal of Open Source Software. So here's my chat with Dan. Hello, Dan. Okay, hello, Peter. You gave a presentation this morning about how RSE community can influence and inspire other people to produce better software. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I wonder if you could just run us through uh, very quickly. I mean, I think the point that I was trying to make really is that the practices of research software engineering are changing over time mm -hmm. and that those practices are in large part being driven by RSEs and what they do. And those RSEs can be seen at three different levels, which I was trying to talk about. One being in specific projects, one being in larger communities, and then the third being within particular organizations within an institution. And so I, I tried to give examples in all three cases of how RSEs in that setting develop practices and how those practices then influence a larger community. And you're also involved in JOS, aren't you? Because I think you mentioned that actually in the talk. JOS was actually one of the categories that I was using. So that was a category of kind of the larger community that I wanted to talk about. Because you can think about the JOS authors and reviewers and editors as a community in some sense. And that was really the argument I was trying to make is that is that collectively that is a community that comes up with standards and comes up with ideas and those ideas then infuse into mm. the larger development community. But to answer your question directly, yeah, I, I was one of the, I don't know, three, five, six people that co-founded JOS in 2016 as well. And it's been going very well so far. I would say it's been going very well in a lot of ways. So it was on a nice growth path. When we got to COVID, the growth path kind of flattened. We took about two months off and didn't accept any new papers while everybody was trying to figure out what how they? their lives were yeah, going to yeah, go yeah. And, and everything else. And when we started accepting papers again, then we got kind of a burst that had been waiting. But we didn't actually get the growth curve back that we had had before. 
So mm. since then, things have been fairly flat in some ways with a very slow growth. We're, we're basically at about a paper a day that yeah. we publish now. We've become a little bit more strict on what we review. So the number of submissions has continued to grow, but the number that we've published hasn't grown very fast. And in general, we've been able to scale the number of editors and numbers of reviewers very well. And we've mm. added a level of organization within the editorial team that's worked well of track mm. editors. I am a little bit concerned that we don't necessarily have have a sustainability model, though. So in what sense? In terms in, of funding? In, in, or well, no, in, I mean, in terms of funding, it's not so much of an issue because yeah. we don't really have any funding and we don't really need any funding. We're so low cost and so volunteer driven that that's not an issue. But the question really is just all the volunteers and if we have, mm. if we're going to run into burnout and if we'll always have a pool of kind of new people right. that are willing to come in. So I think that's really the challenge is that effectively for us to continue to be successful, we need to have new authors coming in, some of them yeah. becoming reviewers, some reviewers becoming editors, some editors moving up to be track editors, mm. maybe some track editor moving up to be editor in chief. And so we haven't really tested that whole path very well over a long enough time to know that it really will work. One of the final questions then, what are your expectations from this conference? I, I think what I'd really like to get out of this is that the people that are here are happy and they feel like coming here is been valuable to them and they go mm. back to their institutions and they tell other people about this and that helps us grow the RSE pool and it also helps from communication that happens here about people learning about I don't know techniques or tools or practices or processes mm. and, and bringing those back and overall that this leads to more RSEs better RSEs and, and that in turn then leads to better software and more sustainable software because I think that's really the goal that we're all trying to get to is right is, is effectively as the SSI says better software, better research. Like Dan, Ian Costin is also a founding member of the US RSE Association. At a conference like this, where everybody is busy talking and meeting with other people, I was glad to grab a few moments out of Ian's time. Hi, Ian. We finally meet because we've seen each other on Slack all the time, and that's a nice thing about conferences like this, that we actually meet people in person like yourself. But you are Ian Costin, and you're in the RSE Association of the US. Right, right from the beginning. That's right, from the very beginning. It's great to meet you. So what's your role in the RSE Association? So I am one of the founding members and the founding chair of the steering committee, so our governing group. Oh, okay. So okay. I've been here since the beginning, and I've been the chair of the steering committee since the very beginning, which is super exciting and fulfilling to see things like this come to fruition. And here we are, the first conference ever, the first face-to-face -face conference, because we had online workshops before, with 250 people. So what's next? How far will it go, Ian? How far will it go? Well, we count. We think we have about 2,000 members right now, and so 20, yeah. uh, 250 folks came to this. I, I think we've done some back-of-the-envelope calculations, and we think we're you know, on the order of 10,000 in the U.S., mm. so we have a lot of outreach still to do. It's clear that the number of people that say, I didn't know this was a thing, I never heard this before, they're still out there. So we've really just scratched the surface on awareness. My personal experience, the demand continued to grow in the community, and therefore more and more people are going to become research software engineers. So I think we're on the order of a quarter of what's out there and what's to come. Multiply everything by four, and I think that's where we're going to end up in the five right. to ten year range. Mm. Yeah, I was quite amazed by the diversity of the audience because I talked to a number of people here on the floor, and a lot of them tell me the same story. I didn't know it was a thing until uh, just a few weeks ago or a few right, months right, ago. Right. Is that your experience as yes, well? Yes, absolutely. Though? We do a lot of other conference outreach where we'll go yeah. and we'll have a workshop or a talk or something, and without fail, every time three to five people come up to me afterwards and say, I didn't know this was a thing. This is amazing. This is great. Tell me more. Right? And, and I keep thinking, I'm saying the same thing over and over again, yet yeah. someone new is hearing it for the first time. There really is still a lot of momentum around bringing new people into it by just raising awareness. And we haven't saturated the market yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And you gave a couple of presentations as well. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? I gave a quick talk about the Princeton University Research Software Engineering Group. We've grown not unlike US RSE from in 2017 it was me and a single RSE to now we're a team of 24 with multiple open positions and more along the way so 30 by next year is realistic and it's likely to keep growing as we've been very fortunate to have research software engineering be a strategic priority from the university there's a lot of HPC work related itself but as you would expect there are a lot of national laboratories so I would like to see how it works then in Princeton. This is also more 
HPC related? Is it very specialized or is it more general? So RC? first, yeah. we didn't talk about this, but had we, this would have been a very interesting thing to lead into. So you got it really great. We started thinking this was HPC. Mm. My group was initially meant because researchers couldn't keep up with HPC software, architectural changes, and that was the software engineering that needed to be done. Fast forward six years, it's maybe a majority of the work we do, mm. but barely. All right. And so oh. really a lot more non-HPC work has come in than we ever expected, including even experimental systems. Software that runs on microscopes, software that is driving fruit fly research needs okay. to be written. And it's not the neuroscientists, it's a little bit over their heads. So we bring in a research yeah. software engineer uh, to develop the code that they use to run these experiments. We never expected that. It seems obvious now. <laughs> but at the time, it was really, we thought it was going to be mostly HPC. And now it's 50-50, maybe a little bit more HPC. What do you expect from the conference then? As a final well, question. it's already exceeded my expectations it, uh, of okay. bringing a community it's together. As someone who, is, who has worked hard to build this community, I was looking to see other people talking. I wanted to see mm -hmm. the technical knowledge being shared, the connections, the network, the spontaneous, oh my goodness. I just overheard you say that. My name's so and so. Can we talk? Yeah, that's been really exciting, and it, and it's happened all over the place. And again, those are the things you can't replicate in Zoom. I just overheard this conversation. Can we chat? Or they're standing in line, waiting to get lunch and spark a what seems like going to be a long-term connection. That's been my goal as kind of a USRC representative to see the community benefit from being together. Finally, this conference wouldn't have happened without all the work, time, blood and sweat that the organizing team and all the volunteers put into it. But let's hear from Sandra Gasing and Julia Damaro themselves, who led the effort. Well done, Sandra. I mean, this was an amazing conference, wasn't it? Thank you so much. We got a lot of positive feedback. I really enjoyed it. After all the preparation for over a year, this was really fantastic. The vibe in the room. I enjoyed the different program topics, the keynotes, mm. and a lot of positive discussions. The sponsors were happy. I would have loved to see a little bit more of the program because behind the scenes we still had to sometimes solve a couple of things, but I hope that the attendees didn't recognize that. Oh, what a Julia. How was it for you then? It was great. I mean, I didn't see much, unfortunately, but it was awesome to see everybody interacting and it felt like, you know, an actual community and you get to meet people for the first time in person. It was it was great. Were you actually surprised by some of the turnout? Because I think it sold out, didn't it? It did sold out multiple times. <laughs> <laughs> multiple times already. Yeah. <laughs> well, we had people cancelling and then we had a wait list and then, you know, people from the wait list got to register and... We had like the last spot on site. We got to register a student who I've seen every day, so she definitely took advantage of it. The next one is going to be in Albuquerque. Are you going to be involved as well then in the organization? Yes, we will still be involved, probably in a role where we can enjoy it much more. <laughs> 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 But of course, we, we took notes. We will take feedback from the community. We yeah. want to address what we can make better and maybe change. For example, the tutorials were before the conference online for free so that also people who could not travel could be part of that and yeah. some people really loved it and some mm. people said like oh tutorials i would like to do that in person also at the conference so maybe we find a middle way there because i still think it's great that the people who cannot travel have also the connection have a program yeah. topic can do it for free online Indeed. And I wanted to ask you, because uh, we've talked about the conference for two and a half days here in Chicago now, but there was a lot happening before that even. And how was that actually going? So that was also going very well. We had re registrations quite high, up to, I, I think, 80 people. And the lowest number in the tutorial were around 16, 17 people, and the highest something around 60. I mean, that oh is wow. great. And finally, did it actually meet your expectations, this conference? It went over my expectations, to be honest. That because of the community, because it was mm -hmm. so vibrant, it was so positive. People mm -hmm. really enjoyed it. That was my impression. And 
I did expect some of it because a lot of people I yeah. know were excited. I was excited, but there was a lot of positive vibe. Okay. That was exceeding my expectations. What about you, Julia? Yeah, pretty much the same. I can't even express how much I appreciated the community support we got. I mm. think I got every day, I got asked at least five times, how can I help? What can I do? <laughs> and I was like, I think we're good. Thank you. Like, <laughs> but I really yeah. appreciate it. Well, excellent. And I think it's now time for gin tonics, isn't it? I'm a whiskey girl. It will be whiskey. Each of their own drinks. And I think congratulations, uh, Sandra, because you're now executive director, aren't you? Thank you so much. So this is really exciting, exciting and a little bit scary because yesterday Neil told me I'm the first executive director, not only of US RSE, but of every RSE association in the world. It's great to see Sandra becoming the first executive of an RSE association worldwide. And I hope that other associations will follow suit, because we need people like Sandra. There's a growing number of RSEs and researchers who code worldwide, and the need for them is growing even more rapidly. And as I said before, communities cannot run on autopilot. And with that in mind, if you haven't joined the US RSE Association already, do it now. It's easy to do and free, and you get immediate access to the communication channels such as Slack. And as you've just heard, there is also another conference to look forward to. The next US RSE conference will take us to New Mexico and the city of Albuquerque. It will again happen in October in 2024. Planning for a conference always starts pretty early, so if you want to help, get in touch with the organization committee. Finally, I'd like to thank the organizers of this conference for allowing me to run around with a microphone and a recording device. I had a lot of fun and met so many interesting people on and off the record. I would also like to thank the Chris Green Quartet from Chicago, whose music you've heard during this episode, with their kind permission. It's from a recording at the Chicago Jazz Festival in 2016. And with that, goodbye. Oh, time's up. See you next time. But before I forget, this podcast is covered by the Creative Commons license. See ya.